you don't look after your car, it's going to break no matter what it is. But if you can't give your vehicle a hard time and you look after it, it's not a full drive, it's a soft rotor. When is a brand new make and model four-wheel drive released? The common complaint is it's too plasticky. It's too round. Not what they used to be. And this thing will not last out in the bush. No way in hell I'd ever buy that vehicle. The same people later on cave in and actually end up buying that vehicle. It grows on them somehow. And then they realize that they were so wrong. The vehicle is actually far more safer, far more comfortable, more advanced. The question is though, is there a point in time where this is no longer the case? I will say yes, and that time is right now. Everything before the line in the sand, which is 2023, is not included in what I'm talking about. Most of those makes and models are fine. The electronics aren't too overcomplicated, but some of them are, and they'll be different colors. So everything red, I think is no good, my opinion, don't forget that. Now everything else designed from 2023 onwards will be on the other side of that line. And that's my line of concern. It doesn't mean that it falls into the category of what I'm talking about, but it falls in a danger line. Everything that's green is what I consider to be very reliable in harsh conditions. And then you got the in-between. Just remember, these are my opinions, but also many other people share the same opinion because I did a poll on this and I think about 80% of people agree that we're at a day and age where the older four-wheel drive is better than a new four-wheel drive. Along the way, I will also be answering your questions, your comments that were on that poll. Let's get into it. Too much tech where car engineering has gone way too far, seemingly making off-road programs that make absolutely no freaking sense. Sand mode, rocks mode, ruts mode, well, they're all fancy little things, but unless this is for clever marketing, then these engineers have no idea about off-roading for a start and have likely never been off-road in a vehicle in the first place. My point here is, folks, how can you beat front and rear lockers? How can you beat the background traction control that the Jeep Wrangler has, that also a 200 series really has a good one, and the FJ Cruiser, an A-Track system, which the FJ Cruiser just reminded me of. We've reached the pinnacle. We've reached the pinnacle of traction controls and four-wheel driving aids. Nothing can top that. No stupid, ridiculous program with different four-wheel drive modes is going to make this any better. It's just going to complicate it. And first-time users for vehicles, I mean, I got confused using it. Finally worked out how to put it into sand mode. I probably should have done this while we were driving earlier. There's no handbook with this vehicle, so I've had to just Google it. it. Made absolutely no difference. We're not supposed to drive around with our mobile devices while we're driving on the highway, which actually requires less attention than when you're off-road, because when you're off-road, you've got bushes, you've got rocks, you've got all kinds of ruts and things you've got to look out for. So having a screen in the middle there with your infotainment that has a full drive system on it like the Ford Ranger does and like the Land Rover Defender does makes absolutely <coughs> sense. If you're a car engineer, stop making ridiculous full wheel drive programs that just makes things worse. It just makes things <coughs> stick to making the car a better car, not trying to reinvent the wheel. How are you going to reinvent front and rear diff lockers? You can't. Okay, unless you can make the vehicle fly you're not gonna assist the traction aids at all. So stop trying to do it. Here's a comment. Silly pole. It's got everything to do with the driver. Newsflash. Best driver in the world goes missing in the Australian outback during a soft sand desert cross. The best driver in the world can drive a vehicle, but if the vehicle's not up to the task, is it the driver's fault really? I think we can all agree that a mechanical connection is stronger than an electrical or a system connection. In the past, you have levers that put it into four-wheel drive, you, you lock your vehicle in, locking manual hubs. I know that's really old school, but if the mechanical side fails, 
it can fail on both sides, but that's the strongest connection. If you're relying on a vacuum actuator or electrical, those things can go into limp mode and possibly not even allow you to go in full drive. So there's so many more things that could go wrong with the electrical side on all the future vehicles, and there's a lot less on the mechanical side. So if you are mechanically minded, you've got a much better chance of fixing something and getting out. Whereas, you need an aerospace degree for some vehicles, like the, the new Defender. Perfect example is the Mitsubishi Pajero, second gen 1990 to 2000, 2003 to 2006 is classic, comes with a rear locker and solid rear axle. Third and fourth generation have no locker, no solid rear axle and even no body on frame construction. The structure of a vehicle is heading towards the point where it can't accommodate for proper protection, front protection, rear protection. They're made to crumble. They're made from thinner metals. They're now mixing things with aluminium and metal to keep the weight of the vehicle down. I kind of get it, keep the weight of the vehicle down, less emissions, blah, 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 blah. But it gets to a point where these vehicles are getting too weak to actually accommodate things on them. Here are some tech problems that I've already experienced firsthand or also with people who have been on tag along tours or just general four wheel driving. Let's take the Prado for instance. This is a 2016 Prado. When the ABS sensor gets dirty and it has a malfunction code and you're in four wheel drive low range, it's okay because you're in low range. Just the minute you go out of low range, you can't go back because there's a fault code. It won't send you back because it can't sense all four wheels anymore. You go at a high range, you're now in two wheel drive or all wheel drive they call it. Now you can't go back to four wheel drive high or four wheel drive low. So if you're in the middle of a trip and you're on some soft sand or you're some gnarly stuff, you're essentially stuffed, man. What are you gonna do? You're gonna need help. You're gonna need to be snatched, towed, winched all the way out of certain areas. Another example, a personal situation I have with my SR5 Hilux N80. When you take that off road and you're in four wheel drive high range, you still got all your anti-collision and all those things turned on. You need to turn those off because if you don't and you turn too sharp, but the vehicle's sensing it's going forward, but it should be turning, it'll freak out and you'll lose your electronic stability control. You lose your lane assist, anti-collision, radar cruise control. You lose so many features on your vehicle. And the worst part is when you hit the highway on your way home or just general driving, you don't have those until you go back to Toyota and get it reset. That is a major pain in the ass. And in recent times, 2022, 2023, the 300 series got released, the new Ford Ranger got released, those two in particular I have test driven and they have sensors. They have a load of sensors. Every time you turn the car on or off or back on, you have to turn those sensors off. You have to turn electronic stability control off. And that is an absolute pain in the ass because when you are driving, say, on a sand dune and you get kind of get stuck and you're reversing and there's a shrub in the way or the shrub enters your sensor range your vehicle will apply its brakes in a violent manner because it thinks you're going to hit something and it'll just get you bogged it's so annoying you've got to constantly turn it off and they beep the beep's probably worst constant beeping it's so annoying does that mean i'm saying that the 300 series and the new ford ranger is they're no good for anything definitely not i'm not saying that what I am saying though, if you took those on the canning stock route or somewhere really like rugged and rough and extreme environment, I would rather take an older school mechanical more driven vehicle than an electronic vehicle. And considering the fact that the Ford Ranger Sport was overheating in low range in soft sand, the Sport version, you would think that it could handle a bit more than that. And with the 300 series, having all those new well, bells and whistles, or both the vehicles really, it's just more stuff to go wrong. It's not trialed and tested. Both of these vehicles also have a 10 speed gearbox or transmission because they're automatic. One of my main reasons driving me to talk about this subject about vehicles past 2023 is comfort and convenience is put over durability and ruggedness. Taking a dedicated full wheel drive to extreme environment makes sense. They're not designed for harsh environments, these vehicles. They're designed for comfort, convenience, safety, giving you all the bells and whistles to try and outsell the opposite version. That's why we're starting to see this fall in durability and, and strength and ruggedness and the ability to adapt and modify these vehicles. There's so many things you can't do to 
these vehicles as opposed to everything before it. In regards to the Ranger overheating with a 10-speed gearbox, I'm sure there's gonna be other vehicles that are gonna do the same. I'm not here to pick on that one car. I thought that car was great, except for that one problem there, and also all the bells and whistles. Sorry, there's a few more things there. It's all that extra tech, it's frustrating. Take, for instance, the X-Trail. Now, I test drove one of those. When you take that off-road, any speed in four-wheel drive over 40 kilometers per hour, it cups out four-wheel drive. Ah, so now it's jumped out of um, lock mode again. I wonder why. Because you're overheating the system. See, it has a CVT transmission, a constant variable transmission, which means there's this rubber band and then it expands and goes down depending on where the, the transmission decides to do. So it's a smooth, no gear change, but it can't handle too much heat. So over 40 Ks, it cuts out. But what happens when you go back under 40 Ks? Nah, it won't go into lock mode. Interesting, I didn't know that. Does it go back in? No, you have to manually go down and flick it back to four wheel drive. And why is that bad? Well, you're cruising along above 40. In some situations, you can get away with that. But what if you start slowing down because you've got to turn on a soft, sandy bend? Now you're in two-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. You go down and you're bogged. That's a problem. That's not a real four-wheel drive. That's a soft rotor. And if you can't take your Ford Ranger with a 10-speed gearbox and go low range on a beach simply four or five times up and down, it's heading towards being a soft rotor. If you can't give it a hard time, is it really a four-wheel drive? Newer are better. But, but older seem better due to the willingness to break them to prove they can do it. You know what? Obviously, older vehicles pre-2000 will have reliability issues if they're not maintained well. But really, that's it's a bit of a loose statement to make. Um, I feel that you're talking about certain people that just thrash the shit out of their car to make content. So that I agree with. But throwing a car around to get somewhere... Sometimes you have to because the track that you're on to get to this destination or say if it's a track you want to muck around on, there are some vehicles you should use and definitely a lot of vehicles you shouldn't be using. And a lot of those vehicles are the ones that we're talking about today, the new four-wheel drive. More tech makes humans lazy. And the lazier you are, the more relaxed you are and you're not paying attention. We're at a day and age where comfort and safety has actually gone too far or it's going too far there should be a overwrought system in these vehicles an off-road system so you press that button and then when you go off-road none of those bells and whistles are going to give you this <coughs> and you're going to have a good time for example lane assist i hate it and many people out there probably do as well i mean there are some people that abuse it and put a water bottle on it so the vehicle thinks your hands are still in the steering wheel and you just drive there with no hands on the wheel don't do that that's just stupid. Lane assist. That might be good on the streets. It might be good on, say, the freeway because you've got lines on either side. But when you use it on country roads, sometimes it gets confused. And I have, during test drives, felt uneasy at high speeds because you, you, you're trying to sit closer to a line where you normally sit, but the vehicle keeps bringing it, it keeps fighting you. And then after a while, you realize, oh, it's this stupid lane assist that's doing it. it gives you an uneasy feeling, I feel. But also... When you try and avoid a pothole, or if you don't indicate, and you try and go around, it pulls you back in. So you end up hitting the potholes. You can't avoid things on the road sometimes. So I think it's a really stupid thing, and it's actually more dangerous when you leave the city. But off-road, with all these sensors and beeps and, you know, just automatic braking because there's something behind you, it's really distracting and frustrating when you're off-road. Too much safety makes things less fun. You might as well wrap us all up in cotton. Unfortunately, the decent new four-wheel drives aren't sold in most countries, so I voted with the old. Well, that makes sense because a lot of countries wouldn't get your robust four-wheel drives. A solid axle four-wheel drive or not even just a solid axle four-wheel drive, say a Y62 Patrol. It's got independent front and rear suspension. Most people called that a <laughs> car when it first came out, but they're actually pretty damn good. They would do the canning stock route, no problem. There are some vehicles... That are just too soft though. For example, would you take a brand new 10 speed transmission vehicle that had just been released with a new motor and a new 
10 speed transmission make model take that across the desert i certainly wouldn't would you if you can't give your four wheel drive a hard time is it really a four wheel drive putting a lot of load on the drive line putting a lot of load on those cvs you know if you can't do that then it's not really a four wheel drive it's a soft rotor Sure, good maintenance goes a long way, service history, that goes without saying. If you don't look after your car, it's going to break no matter what it is. But if you can't give your vehicle a hard time and you look after it, it's not a full drive, it's a soft rotor. Well, that's my opinion on the matter. What is your opinion? Have we reached a point where newer vehicles are getting worse than the older vehicles? Because I don't think it's stand true until now. And I haven't even touched on electric vehicles. If you want me to do that, let me know in the comments below. And while you're there, before that timer runs out, hit that subscribe button. Because if you don't, you're going to end up with a new vehicle and you're going to be stuck in the desert. So hit that button right now before that timer goes out. And also check out the members if you want to know about some cool perks with this channel. Thanks guys. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you in the next video.